Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I am your host, Blake Morgan, and I'm recording this June 15th, and I am actually going on my first vacation with my husband in like three or four years. We are going to Mexico, and I can't wait. I can't wait for the experience because that's what we're talking about today. It's all about the customer experience. And so many of you listening and hopefully seeing this on YouTube are ready for an experience that is different because we are ready to enjoy life again. But I do love my work. I love this podcast. And today I have a really fun and interesting guest on the show. Her name is Tiffany Perkins Munn. She is the head of data and analytics for the innovative CDAO organization at JP Morgan Chase. Dr. Perkins Munn earned her PhD in social personality psychology with an interdisciplinary focus on advanced quantitative methods. Her insights are the subject of many lectures on psychology, statistics, and their real-world applications. Prior to her role um, at Chase as Managing Director, Head of Marketing, Data, and Analytics, she was Managing Director, Global Head of Research, Analytics, and Data for BlackRock, and she's held a variety of really interesting data roles. Today, we are talking about AI marketing. We're talking about company coaching and big data analytic tools that provide data-informed decision-making. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Let's get to it. Tiffany, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast, all the way from New Jersey. I am so excited to see your face today on the show. For our viewers watching and our listeners tuning in, can you just tell us how you came into this awesome, awesome role at J.P. Morgan and the story of Tiffany, the high-level story? (laughs) Yes, of course. Um, Basically, my whole career has really been in reference to like data and analytics, right? Research, data, analytics. By training, I have a PhD in social personality um, psychology and also a joint degree in advanced quantitative methods. Wow. And I know that sounds fancy, but <laughs> what that really translates into is measurement of behaviors. So throughout my entire career, whether I've been in working in retail or working in financial services or working at a hedge fund, it's really always been about measuring the behaviors of different populations and audiences that are relevant to those businesses. Um, and so the good news is that because I've done this over a number of industries, I know a lot about Um, data and analytics and ways to be interdisciplinary and how I think across those solutions. Um, And it's really led to like lots of opportunities to be critical, uh, be a critical thinker um, in these spaces. Well, psychology and data, I mean, you don't often find that marriage. And so I know you work in the innovation part of the organization. Um, Can you tell our listeners what, what department you're in? Like, how would you describe it? So it's marketing, but it's really innovation because it's really about how do you use data and analytics in a more thoughtful, creative way? Um, How do you build a capability that really lives outside the boundaries of a function, right? So it's how do you bring together all of the capabilities of the organization through the lens of innovation to really make sure that we are delivering the the best um, experience for the consumer, right? So it's not, I sit in marketing, but it's not all about marketing only. It's also about sales. It's about operations. It's about all the places that we engage with consumers and how we bring that understanding together to really deliver a top-notch consumer experience. When I speak to audiences, I always remind them, you know, banking has totally transformed. We are not in the world that we knew. If you like the person sitting next to them, next to you, like you can literally send them a thousand dollars in 30 seconds or less. Like this is a completely (laughs) new world. The whole crypto thing, you know, that's not something I'm really focused on, but I mean, there's just so much change all the time in your industry. How yes. do you how do you deal with this changing world and changing consumer when banking is just moving so much more quickly than we're used to? 
Well, the good news is that data and analytics really helps us to drive all of that cohesion to another level, right? Because this is not your grandmother's banking experience, right? So think about you go into the bank and everything that you used to do, any conflict resolution, problem solving, deposits, payments, anything you needed to do happened. You had to leave your house, put on your coat, go yes. to the bank, talk to a person. They had to be open, right? Like now yes. things are 24 seven. And the more that we capture and understand who our consumers are, like they're they're engaging with us in so many different places to your point. They're, on, they're digitally engaging with us. We yeah. have apps, there are websites, they are going to our events, they're going to the branch when they want to. There are interactions that happen. You know, we're making sure that we're protecting their money through fraud protection and we're alerting them when something goes wrong. So we are, we actually have access to so much data and information now that the question really becomes, how do we utilize, consolidate, aggregate, manipulate, manage all of that data and information in a way that will allow us to better understand what our consumers need, how to get in front of their needs and actually anticipate those needs and offer them things that they need even before they realize it, like, you know, something is coming and how do we get an understanding of what that thing is in a timely fashion to offer it to them? So when the, the, the need arises, they've already they already have an opportunity to engage with it. So generally, when I think about marketing, I think about acquiring new customers, but it kind of sounds like that's not really what you do specifically. Is that like, how would you describe to someone who really wasn't familiar with your arena at all, like exactly what you do in marketing? Is the goal to acquire customers? Is it to retain of customers? Course. Of course. <laughs> Marketing's goal is always about acquisition, right? But that's like yesterday's marketing story. Today's marketing story is not only about acquisition, it's about it is about acquisition. It's about how do we get new, new customers, just to keep it simple, and existing new customers. So new, new customers is your traditional acquisition. They have no engagement with us, no engagement with our products, and we're trying to go out, find them where they are, figure out who out in the world looks like someone who might be one of our customers and how do we bring them in, right? Then there's existing new customers who are, maybe you have a card with us, a credit card, or maybe you have a mortgage, but that's really all that you do. Then the question becomes, how do we engage them? How do we understand enough about them, their life's journey, where they are on the path, what their family dynamics look like? How do we help them through our through different products and services, engage with additional products or services, right? So that's sort of their existing, and then we want to in introduce them to a new product. And a lot of it is, so those are at the at base level, that's really what our goals are, but really they're so much more complicated because it's really about building a holistic view of how our clients want to engage with us figuring out how to build those really meaningful, deep rooted relationships so that they feel like they, we are trusted advisors. We're not just your bank. Like we cover so many of your life's needs that we are a trusted advisor to you. Even if you deal with us only digitally, which is like mind blowing, like you could have a trusted advisor that you only engage with digitally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's the new world order. And that's where we're going um, in the marketing space. Yeah, I am a customer and I love, I love the digital experience. Like I would never switch. I would never because it's just really helped me so much. Like so many life moments, you know, Chase has been there for us. So like buying a house and like saving yeah. money. Like when I lived in New York City and I was in my 20s and I banked with another bank, I was constantly getting overdraft fees. And I was laughing recently with a group of bankers that, you know, I once was on a webinar with a head of a bank, like a customer experience head, and they said they liked when customers couldn't pay back their credit card, like when they forgot, because the bank makes money. And I was like, mm -hmm. so turned off by that, because I feel right. like for banking today, it's about helping customers. Even if you could make money in a way that where they're suffering, like that's not good. So right. I was so shocked for them to so candidly say like, oh yeah, we like when they forget to pay their credit card because I, and I said, 
You know, I was once that 25 year old living in New York City right. who, like, I so was I. I had credit card debt, like ugly credit card debt, stupid credit card debt, and so today it's yes. all about being like a trusted advisor and friend. Right. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So you are an expert in AI machine learning. This is a tough concept for so many to grasp. You're looking at patterns and data and serving up the next best action. Is there any yep. lessons learned that you could provide our listeners, like something that you figured out about doing machine learning AI, like really using it in a way that makes sense? So when you think about it, I think people don't, they hear the term, they use the term, they don't fully understand what it is. And part of the challenge is that so many firms and organizations and companies actually still live in Excel, right? Oh, yeah. A lot of the data that they're doing is on Excel, the, their transformations, their analysis. So when we start talking AI, it sounds like something that's out there, that's coming, that hasn't quite arrived yet. Um, and but it happens in our everyday life, which is what I think people don't understand. Really all AI is, artificial intel intelligence, is a constellation of many different technologies, right? That are capable of performing tasks while requiring, you know, requ that require human intelligence, right? So um, technologies that can learn, can act and perform with human-like levels of intelligence. And when we apply that to marketing, that really means leveraging those technologies to do things like collect information, um, to, to do analysis, to drive customer insights, to anticipate to what you were saying earlier about customers' next move, next moves, and to make automated decisions that require like little effort or less effort than, than is typical, right? So if you think about where in our lives, and sometimes I use examples because I feel like when people hear the examples of how AI plays out in their daily lives, it actually resonates with them. Mm -hmm. So if you think of things like um, Google, Google uses what's called Smart Compose, and it reads, you know how you go, you t you're typing, do, 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 in your email, Google understands what you're saying, and it suggests what you should type next, right? You've seen that capability, right? Yeah, sometimes That's people get freaked out by it, you know, by yeah. these things, but I think yes. it's helpful. I do. Yes. <laughs> so sometimes it's wrong, but the point is that's AI, right? And, um, but for me, I really feel like when they are, when I, you know, people are like, oh my God, I was on some social media platform and they offered me something that yeah. was similar to something. They're following me. Yeah. By the way, I love all of that. Okay. All of it. Okay. Like, Follow me, please, All right. because I love it when they offer me something that I haven't been exposed to and I really want it and I buy it right away. So you have nothing to hide, TikTok. obviously. I buy from everywhere, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, wherever yeah. I see it, yeah. if they introduce it to me. And you know why it doesn't bother me? Because I am a Chase client <laughs> and my fraud protection is oh. top notch. Oh, it is. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't worry. I, mean, I hate to say it, but I don't worry so much about it. Yeah. Um, but other places like Alexa, almost everybody has like some kind of Alexa or everybody's talking to their phone with Siri. Right. So what happens? The, the technology recognizes the spoken word. It converts them into text and then it does a command. It basically executes a command yeah. so that, you know, that's in our everyday life. Um for people who are like runners and really active who buy Nike. And if you buy your Nike online, there's a whole, have you bought Nikes online? There's a whole. I need to. I'm very cheap. I buy things on, <laughs> I buy like maybe a lesser brand, but yeah, I, th I just want to know the process because everyone says that Nike is the most innovative with personal yeah. Like I want to experience that. Yep. So just go on and pretend like you're going to buy a pair. And you can walk through the experience, but it is a highly personalized experience that they take you on through the through your journey on the site, right? Mm -hmm. So all, but all of this, Amazon and their recommendations, cars now have smart technology, personal assistants that you can talk to, like you talk to your phone. So all of these are really ways that AI infuse and in, in our current lives and actually how we rely on AI. And mm. so 
in business settings, when people are like, we're going to do AI, I think there's a disconnect because not everyone fully understands. I think all the things you and I just discussed, people see that as technology, but they don't know that it's AI fueled technology. Like right. that technology can do that because of AI. Right. So the, when you make the connection, it seems to be an easier thing to understand for people, easier for them to digest and, and sort of incorporate into the way that they see the world. So Chase is an enormous bank. You guys have so many customers. When I think about your job and what you've just said about creating more customers, retaining more customers, it just seems like overwhelming. Like you have millions, you might even have hundreds of millions of customers. So where do you even begin to make progress when there are just so many customers? Like where do you even begin on your process? Well, you start at the beginning, which is data. Yeah. You always start with the data, like really trying to figure out who are the consumers, what are their needs, what are their behaviors. And you don't want to do like finger in the wind, like mm, that's what we did last year that works. Or I have a friend who does that. That's probably a profile of a consumer. You really want to use information that will allow you to create a consistent story. Right. So so you're not guessing you're not using your intuition. Imagine trying to apply intuition to millions of, of consumers and users, right? Yeah. So when you start to automate the decision-making process through data-driven decision-making, you get an established airtight process that really starts to help you understand who the consumers are in a real, really meaningful way mm -hmm. so that you can subsequently offer products, prop solutions, services that are personalized. You've heard that word, right? Mm -hmm. That are personalized to their needs. And, but you can only do you. So to your question, you always start with the data and you always think through the the, the consumer journey to understand how to make that journey more useful, more impactful, more meaningful, where they get more information out of it. They're obviously, they go, they get what they need when they come. But all of those really start with, with the data, with how effectively you use the data. And Tiffany, do you feel pretty comfortable trusting the data that you have? And if that was a, a journey or evolution, like what made you more comfortable over time? I, so when I get data from third parties, so it, across my career, I've always been in positions where we have data, we, we have data because we have consumers or clients, depending upon the role in which that I was in. And, but we sometimes supplement that data with third party information. Um, data that we collect ourselves and build governance practices around and we know is robust and clean and you know even if it changes over time if we have a process in place for how we keep the data updated i feel pretty confident in and even now with third-party providers um i feel that over the years they have done a pretty good job of um, remediating, fixing, changing, modifying processes so that they are constantly bringing in and filtering in new updated information about whomever they have in their database. So generally these days, data is pretty good. Plus people um, are now more willing to share information. If they share, they want to make sure that the way that they are presented is correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're going to share your information with a with any type of firm, you want to make sure that what they know about you is accurate, that you're the one providing it and that it's helping you because the goal is to help you. It's helping you get what you need. And so because people, I think, are more involved in the process now and it's not just like some hidden behind the scenes activity where people are sneaking information um, it's a much more meaningful endeavor. And so you can trust the data more. And so you will find that over time, things that are personalized to you get better and better. That's because using data, the system learns that what's right and what's wrong, what you like and what you don't. So you might remember earlier social media, you, you would buy a pair of shoes and then you'd go on social media that next day mm -hmm. and they would they would suggest those same shoes to you. Right. And you're like, right? well, I just like, bought them. Right. And you're like, um, I just bought those shoes. Yeah. 
But the reality is now they are starting to learn. So they may offer you another brand of the same shoe or another, even another design with a different brand. Mm -hmm. And that's how the system continues to get smarter. And I really appreciate the fact that people are are starting to understand um, how they can provide information that will ultimately help them and really start to manage the data privacy issues, right? Because I think there was a period where everyone was like so worried about data privacy. Not that it's gone away, it's not. It's a very important um, legal and compliance issue, but really working in partnership with people who are providing information like you and me so that we fully understand how it's being used and what the benefit is to us. So I used to be a practitioner like you. I worked at a Fortune 100 technology company. And one of the hardest things about my job was collaborating with marketing. I worked in customer service. How often do you actually meet with customer service um, in your role in the contact center? All the time. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. All the time. Cool. I told you this is not your grandma's marketing organization. Yes. Okay. So tell us what does that look like? That looks like really understanding. So what you want to have is this connected client experience, which is a single line of sight into our clients' behaviors. Like when are they going to the ATM? When are they going into the branches? When are they calling? When is a fraud protection triggered? When they And so every time there's a call into the call center, we want to know. Mm-hmm. We want to know was the call resolved or was it not? Was it something that needed to be escalated? How was it escalated? How was it resolved? Did it impact any other elements of the business? Was it a quick fix, right? So all of those, anytime you pick up the phone and make a call, we're capturing it. Mm -hmm. And we're checking to make sure that things are happening quickly, that resolution is happening smoothly. We want you to have a great experience all through the journey. Right. So if something doesn't we're learning as we're going, though. So I think sometimes people just assume like, well, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. But believe me, the likelihood that that will happen twice is very small because the learning from taking that data and realizing that it took five days to resolve your issue when really it should have taken a day and a half, depending on you know what research it was that needed to be done to answer the question. Um, we learn from that. And then the next time you have the experience, it gets better. So yes, call center, in branch activities, online activities, those are all set up to have triggers that feed into a system where we can understand what the client is, you know, how the client is engaging with us across those different platforms. So I'm a big contact center geek. I love this stuff so much. So I would love to know, what does that look like when the contact center shares data with you? I mean, would you be comfortable painting the picture of what it looks like for you literally like on your desktop? Like, what do you see? Well, every customer has a unique identifier. So it looks like, you know, some some event happens and the data comes through, you get daily feeds. And if there was a escalation event of any sort, there's a trigger and you see that there was a trigger for that escalation event and you can follow like what investigation was done, what, you know, what offer was made, you know, what the resolution was. And sometimes it's not, so that's the sort of quick and easy version of it. Sometimes it's not quite so straightforward because some, some inquiries that come in require research. So Someone has to go off and do some research to figure out how to develop a plan for the resolution. And then whatever that plan is, it has to go through those steps. So it might not make it to me as immediate as my description sounds. But in summary, that's basically how it happens through the systems. So from what I'm getting from our interview, I mean, you do quite a bit of stuff. I mean, you're really like an internal subject matter expert at Chase. So, I mean, you're looking at marketing opportunities. You're literally acting like a contact center manager, like seeing a, um, a screen with th- with contact center issues. To me, that's very shocking because when I worked in customer service, marketing didn't even know us. So that's very, very cool. Um, What do you think the biggest lesson is for our listeners and viewers? A lot of them are contact center practitioners. You know, you're in marketing, but you also have your toe in the contact center. Do you have any advice for these people that are struggling with data, with some of the things that you've struggled with just to, um, in your career, kind of start to put AI and machine learning to work in a way that serves the customer? Yeah. 
So um, just to clarify, I'm not a contact center manager. I would, and anyone who's watching who hears me say that I am would probably be like, that's not what she does. Um, however, I do have access to data that happens in the contact center. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned historically is that contact center data sits over there. Like events, marketing activity data sits over there. Digital access data sits over there. Fraud protection data sits over there. I mean, you get the idea. And it's always so disjointed and sometimes not even, I gave you a, a situation where we have a unique identifier for a consumer and that we can thread the needle, right? Through all of the data to help us understand that consumer better. That's not always the case. Often you have inability to bring together systems that hold um, consumer information because they're not speaking to each other, there are legacy problems, there's lots of connectivity issues. But I would say that we all try to boil the ocean, right? We're mm -hmm. always like, oh my God, we got to bring all these various things together. We got to tell a story. Start small with data. You work in a contact center, pick a group of clients, um, maybe those that are I don't know, who have recently, just pick something randomly, anyone who's recently called into the contact center in the last six months, for example, if that gives you a large enough, and then say, I want to understand who these people are. What, what data within your firm would you need to help you understand who they are and how you can deliver a better contact system, a contact um, center experience? You might want to know how else are they engaging with us, right? Are they coming to events? Are they on our digital assets? Are they going into physical locations? Um, you might want to know, have they, you know, have they, what other activities are they doing with us that are not marketing? Like how are they engaging with sales teams, et cetera, for example? And then you talk to people who actually sit in those spaces who own that data so that you can start to stitch together because that's what it's going to be, a manual stitching together of information to help you. And by the way, we're talking AI, but you can use Excel. You can do Excel for this. I mean, I'm saying that because I think people hear AI and they're like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Mm -hmm. We'll start small, mm -hmm. pull together requisite pieces of information using Excel to help give you some insight and some learnings and then graduate slowly to more sophisticated analytics, more sophisticated technologies until you get to a place where maybe you're building a recommendation engine to help you recommend something to this set of clients that you've chosen based on what you've learned about them. But it's a process. And I think people should start small, start with small samples, start with data, um, try to stitch it together manually to the extent that you can, and then slowly build out capabilities. Um, and that's a little bit more manageable because it can be a very daunting process getting involved with data in mass like this. Oh, absolutely. And I think there's a big learning curve, but like you said, just start small. And I think people yeah. will be happy with the results. So now is the fun part of the podcast where my audience gets yeah. to know you a little bit, Tiffany. Um, are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Yeah. All right. Great. Um, all right. First question. You're stuck on an island. You have access to water, but you can bring one other food and one other drink. What are they? Oh, my. One other food would be pizza. Because you know why? Because pizza, even cold, is good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> you said I have water? Yeah, so you can bring any drink that you like other than water. Mm -hmm. I'd probably bring Jack Daniels. All right. All right. Cool. it will be good with the pizza. <laughs> um, if you could have lunch with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so this question, my answer to this question varies day by day. Oh. Um, today though, it's Prince. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you're not, the last guest said that same thing and you know, his oh, wow. lives on. Yeah. He was so talented. Um, tell me what is your most embarrassing work moment? Um, oh my God. I used to teach, uh, so I teach at universities, various universities and, it wasn't a bad thing, but it was, I was fairly embarrassed. So I'm standing in the hallway, um, and this was maybe 10, 15 years ago, 
waiting. Someone had locked the door. So we were all standing in the hallway. It was my first day. Me, all the students were all in the hallway. And they started talking about the professor. <laughs> they said, oh, have you heard about this professor? What's her name? Um, oh, yeah. Has anybody taken her? What do you think about her? Oh, oh, you've heard that? <laughs> you know, they started talking about me right there on the spot. And I was, it was so weird. It was awkward. I didn't want to say, well, that's me. Right. But I also wanted to hear what they had to say. But I just, I just kind of moved away. So maybe in, in, as time went on, you know, through the day, they wouldn't realize that I was so standing so closely to them. And um, when we got into the classroom and I went to the front of the class, they were so incredibly embarrassed. They were like, I was embarrassed too because I had kind of overheard their conversation. And they were like, oh my God, did you hear what we said? And you know, I was like, oh, I heard a little bit of it, but not, not you know, not much of it. But yeah. it was very, it was a very interesting experience. And then you failed them, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's a no. very movie-esque moment. That reminds me <laughs> of like, many movies that I've seen that is yeah I mean that that would be that would be weird to hear that um if you had one billion dollars what would you do with it first um the very first thing I would do is I know this sounds so cliche but it's the truth um I feel like there are so many starving people in the world and all we need is financial solutions to build um, technologies and capabilities within countries to help them have access to water, mm -hmm. um, which is a necessity. And I just feel like people, we haven't spent enough time and money there. Like I heard the other day that, you know, that new golf association, I forgot that the PGA is mad at whatever. Um, they are spending billions of dollars or they're happy to spend billions of dollars to get this new version of the golf association up and running and i'm thinking to myself billions of dollars there are people starving in the world who can't eat who have access limited access to water and 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 things that they need to just live their basic lives and you're starting a billion dollar golf association yeah I just, it's I sad just, yeah yeah what is one tool or resource you use during covid to develop yourself and make it through um I don't think I used any tools or resources, but I did a lot of reading. I read things that I would not have characteristically read. Um, I read a lot of uh, nonfiction books where I maybe ne I wouldn't have necessarily read those books typically because I'm a big sort of fiction sci-fi reader. Mm -hmm. um, but those books were suggested to me, not like self-help books, but like autobiographies of someone or all about the, you know, the history of Christi Christianity and the beginnings of the Bible and mm -hmm. how, you know, the Roman Empire, like things like that. I read a lot about um, different civilizations and cultures and the history of during um, COVID. And I probably, like now that we're out of COVID, I'm back to reading my mm -hmm. sci-fi, you know, non -fic I mean, fiction books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you back? Are you commuting to New York City, can I ask? Yeah. We're commuting. Oh, so you're back, back to work. We're back to three days, three days a week in the office. Um, I have a team that sits all over. So, um, I'll, you know, in multiple places across the United States, I'm traveling to visit them again now. Um, I wouldn't say things are back to, you know, pre-COVID days. I don't think they ever will be back mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. um, but we are regaining some sense of normalcy um, in the new structure. Well, this has been so fun. I actually hope you'll come back because yeah. I really have enjoyed this interview so much. Yeah. Are you comfortable with people connecting with you on LinkedIn if they want to learn I more am. about you? Absolutely. All right. Happy to. All right. Well, you have been listening to Tiffany Perkins Munn, and you can find her on LinkedIn. You have been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast, everybody. Thank you for listening. Until next time.